Welcome to another in our series, Jewish 101, a series for anyone interested in learning all about all things Jewish, beginning with an understanding of the Jewish tradition, its philosophy, and its way of embracing life. I'm Mark Golub. Thank you for joining me. And a special thank you to all of you who've sent me such wonderful emails and letters with kind things to say about our series, Jewish 101, and with some excellent questions, which I'll be addressing on an upcoming edition of this program. But this time, I'd like us to look at one of the most important of all Jewish festivals, even though, sadly, very often it gets short shrift, not enough attention in the overall Jewish community. And I'm talking about the festival of Sukkot, what's often called the Feast of Booths, since the Sukkah is a sort of hut or booth constructed for this holiday. And Sukkot is also known within the Christian community as the Feast of Tabernacles, since the tabernacle often refers to a holy place in which to dwell. But in the Jewish community, the holiday of, or festival is known either by its Hebrew name, Sukkot, which is also known as Sukkot in the Ashkenazi community, or in English as the Feast of Booths. Just five days after Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the most serious day on the Jewish calendar, the Jewish people emerge from the ten days of awe, of repentance and atonement, when the Jewish people spend time and energy reflecting on the failures of the prior year, and prepare to begin a new year, recommitted to becoming sweeter, more caring individuals, and more committed and involved Jews. The Jewish people then erupt in a festival of pure joy, the ultimate Chag, which is the Hebrew word for holiday, the festival of Sukkot, which is actually called the Chag, the festival. What a contrast to the high holidays, which is why it's simply sad for any Jew to miss out on the joy of the festival of Sukkot. By the way, the term festival is a better term to use than holiday when it comes to Sukkot because of the importance given to it in the Torah. Also, Jewish festivals are usually seven days in duration, with an eighth day being added in the diaspora outside of Israel. So Sukkot is a seven-day festival celebrated for eight days, for example, here in the United States. According to the Torah, the five books of Moses, in the book of Leviticus, the children of Israel are given a number of annual festivals of special importance. Of course, the most important Jewish holiday is the Shabbat, the Sabbath, which begins every Friday night at sundown and extends until Saturday night at sundown. And the Sabbath, the Shabbat, is without question the most important of all Jewish holidays. But then, in addition to the weekly Shabbat, the Torah lists a series of annual festivals, all of which, and this is very important to understand, all of which commemorate an event in the early history of the Jewish people. In fact, the festival cycle each year reflects the sweep of history which the Israelites lived in the first 40 years of their collective life as they leave Egypt. And the Jewish tradition specifies three major festivals that mark the three most important stages in the emerging life of the Jewish people some 3,000 years, 3, years ago or so. And I'm sure many of you know the three major stages and events that the Torah and the Jewish tradition ask Jews to relive each year. And I hope you heard that word, relive. That's the Jewish insight, the Jewish perspective on the critical moments in the Jewish people's collective past. Jews do not commemorate their major events of the past. It's not about simply remembering the events of the past. Jews relive the past. Jews relive the journey of the Jewish people and relive the moments that shaped and defined Jewish identity and Jewish values and the Jewish vision. When Jews celebrate any Jewish holiday, 
there to feel the experience of the historical event, which is the focus and the reason for the holiday's observance. We're to feel we are there. We were part of it in a marvelous way. Jewish celebrations, Jewish celebrations of all festivals reaffirm the purpose and goals that drive the Jewish journey through life down to this very day and as far as that you can imagine into the Jewish future. And that's why so much emphasis and attention is placed on the adult celebration of Jewish festivals. And I make this point because so many Jewish adults have been brought up thinking that Jewish holidays are for children. That Sukkot or the non-Torah holidays of Hanukkah and Purim are meant for children. And often Jewish adults don't understand how meaningful and important Jewish holidays are as ways for them to relive and reaffirm the Jewish quest the Jewish obsession, which as we've explained many times, is to improve every single thing in this beautiful but still to be completed world and to begin the improvement with our own selves, that each of us might become lovelier and sweeter human beings in all our dealings with our fellow human beings. And this is as true for the Festival of Booths, Sukkot, as it is for any of the Jewish festivals. Jewish adults miss out. They cheat themselves when they don't celebrate Sukkot. So let me ask you this. If we look at Jewish holidays as a whole, which is the first festival of the Jewish year? The first Jewish festival. Which Jewish holiday begins the Jewish year? And if you answered Rosh Hashanah, your answer would reflect what most Jews do say, since we all know that Rosh Hashanah is the start of the new year. But let me remind you of something. The Jewish calendar follows the life of the Jewish people, not of the world. It follows the life of the Jewish people. And the first month of the Jewish calendar, therefore, is the month in which the Jewish people are born. The world has its birthday. It's Rosh Hashanah. But the Jewish people have their birthday. And they celebrate their birth on the holiday of Passover, Pesach. And since Passover falls at the new moon during the month of Nisan, Nisan becomes the first month on the Jewish calendar. And the Jewish year begins with the festival of Pesach, Passover. By the way, if this is confusing for any of you, think of it this way. Suppose you're born, let's say, on September 18th. On your personal calendar, the 18th, is your birthday, your life begins every September 18th, it renews. And if you were to make a calendar of your own, in which September 18th were the first month of your personal calendar, the world would still celebrate its birthday on December 31st, which on your personal calendar would be in the fourth month. That's what the Jewish calendar does. The Jewish calendar counts month one as the month of Nisan in which the Jewish people are born as a collective group with their exodus from Egypt. And so if Nisan is the first month, then the birthday of the world, Rosh Hashanah, which falls in the month of Tishri, falls in the seventh month of the Jewish people's calendar. The Jewish people's calendar begins with Nisan. The new year begins on the first day of the seventh month of the Jewish people's calendar. Rosh Hashanah celebrates the birthday of the world on the first day of the seventh month of the Jewish people's own year. And just as you might celebrate your personal birthday on September 18th, or whenever your birthday falls, you would still celebrate New Year's Day. 
New Year's Eve on December 31st, New Year's Day on January 1st. And if you see it that way, you'll understand how the Jewish calendar works. And the key point is, the Jewish calendar follows the life of the Jewish people. And so it begins with the month in which the Jewish people were born, the month of Nisan, when the Jewish people celebrate the festival of Passover. And if Passover is the first major event, the first stage in the journey of the Jewish people as a whole, what do you guess is the second major event in this journey, which will lead to the second of the three major Jewish festivals? And I'm sure many of you said Mount Sinai. The first event in the Jewish people's journey was the exodus from Egypt, extending from the night of the 10th plague when the Israelites left Egypt through their crossing of the Red Sea a week later. That's event number one. And six weeks after that, seven weeks after leaving Egypt, the children of Israel arrive at a modest mountain known as Mount Sinai, where the Jewish tradition tells us the Jewish people came in contact with God and in some mysterious and wondrous way received the Torah, which is forever at the very heart of the Jewish people's collective identity and purpose. The Torah, which through the genius of rabbinic commentary expresses all the values and goals and ideals of the Jewish people. You know, there are many, many explanations of what really happened at Sinai. So many different descriptions of what really happened there. Some are extremely literal. Some extraordinarily poetic. And on Jewish 101, we spent a great deal of time showing the multiplicity of views of what Sinai means to the Jewish people. But no matter how a Jew interprets Sinai, no matter what a Jew believes did or did not happen literally at Sinai, every Jew understands that the Jewish people became wedded to Torah as a community, as a family, and that that wedded relationship or covenant has extended throughout time. And so the second of the Jewish festivals in the Torah is the festival of Shavuot or Shavuos, often called in English the Feast of Weeks, since the word Shavuot means weeks, the plural of week, referring to the seven weeks that it took the children of Israel to reach Mount Sinai after leaving Egyptian bondage. The children of Israel escaped slavery on Passover, and we live that event on the festival of Pesach, Passover. And then seven weeks later, the Jewish people will live their commitment to a new way of life, a new way of, of viewing the world, a new way of viewing man's responsibility to one's fellow man, male and female. And this reliving occurs on the festival of Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. And so, what's the third stage of the journey which transformed the children of Israel into the Jewish people? and which becomes the paradigm for the Jewish sense of history. History. What is the third event which the Jew is asked to relive each year by the Torah? And the third event is the journey the Jewish people began once they left Egypt. Leaving Egypt begins the third stage, the third event. For after Sinai, the Jewish people head off to the land of Canaan, the land of their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if you know the narrative of the Torah in the fourth book of the Torah, the book of Bamidbar, the book of Numbers, you know how ultimately the children of Israel wound up wandering in the wilderness for an entire generation. Often it's said 40 years. It's literally 37 years from Sinai, to Canaan, but it was on their way to the promised land. So that the third event, the third stage of Jewish history, which is to be relived by every one of us every year, is this wandering in the wilderness. And all the while we lived in temporary dwelling places, 
and that brings us to the third of the three major Torah festivals, the festival of Sukkot, or Sukkot, the Feast of Booths, by which the Jewish people relive, relive, the Jewish people's wandering in the wilderness for, again, symbolically, for 40 years, for a generation, the length of time it took the Israelites to go from Egypt at the exodus in Egypt until the children of Israel were prepared at the end of the Torah to cross the Jordan River and return to their homeland. And these three festivals, Pesach, Passover, Shavuot, Feast of Weeks, and Sukkot, Feast of Booths, are all described in the book of Leviticus. And in the Jewish tradition, these three festivals become the three holidays on which in ancient times Jews made a special pilgrimage to the temple in Jerusalem in order to offer special holiday sacrifices. In Hebrew, these three holidays of Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot are called the Shalosh Regalim, which literally means the three feet, but idiomatically refers to the three festivals on which the Jewish people would make a pilgrimage by foot to the temple in Jerusalem. And even today, although the temple remains in ruin, many Jews make a special point of traveling to Jerusalem to stand at the western wall, which was part of the retaining wall that held up the temple mount upon which the temple stood until its destruction by the Romans in the year 70 CE. And these Jews come to Jerusalem to fulfill the Torah command to make a pilgrimage three times a year on the Shalosh Regalim to Jerusalem. So how do Jews celebrate the festival of Sukkot? What do Jews do on Sukkot to relive this wandering in the wilderness? And what's it mean to celebrate or commemorate the wandering in the wilderness? Well, first and foremost, the central mitzvah, mitzvah meaning commandment, the most important commandment which is to be observed on Sukkot is to dwell in the Sukkah for the entire holiday. Every Jewish holiday has a defining mitzvah, a defining commandment. Not that it's the only commandment associated with a given holiday, but there's always one mitzvah that captures the essence of the observance of the holiday. And the defining mitzvah of Sukkot, or Sukkot, is to dwell in the sukkah, the sukkah. And so all over the world, Jews erect these temporary booths, we call them, or huts, temporary dwelling places to relive the temporary dwelling our ancestors lived in during their 37 or 40 year journey from Sinai to Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel. Again, this, it's hard to know what year to, what year to use 37 or 40 because ultimately it was a 40 year journey from Egypt to the Promised Land. Everybody talks about the 40 years. 40 or 37, it doesn't matter. We wandered in the wilderness a generation. It should be no, uh, noted, by the way, that in Israel, the weather is often idyllic for Sukkot. One of the times you'd love to be in Israel is to celebrate the holiday of Sukkot. Jews, wherever they live throughout the world, they build a Sukkah. We all build a Sukkah. But the festival was meant to be celebrated in Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel. So Sukkot most often comes toward the end of September or in October, when the weather in America and other parts of the world can be far less conducive to dwelling outside in a temporary structure. In Israel, the weather tends to be idyllic. But no matter, many individual American Jews build their own sukkah in their backyard, on their back porch, even inside their apartment. And I have to tell you, the Sukkot I will always remember most personally was a Sukkot my father and uncle built for my grandparents when I was a very young child, way before Bar Mitzvah. And they built it inside my grandparents' Manhattan apartment on West End Avenue. And I remember how we all ate in that Sukkah. 
I get chills telling you about it. By the way, my grandmother at the end of the dinner, I remember sitting around this table, my grandmother brought out an album. Actually, it was album after album of these old family photographs, photos I'd never seen before. And she talked about every picture and who was in it and what happened. And I remember the evening never seemed to end. And obviously for me, it's never ended. And it's interesting from a halachic perspective, according to Jewish law, you can't build a sukkah inside an apartment. There are very specific rules for what constitutes a kosher sukkah. And there's a lot of latitude, a lot of leeway. It can be built out of any material. A sukkah, whether of wood and chicken wire, whether of leather flaps for the sides, as is often done now. Doesn't matter. It's decorated, by the way, with fruits and vegetables and foliage and branches and leaves. It has the smell of the outdoors. But in some way, it always has to be open to the elements. And some people argue you have to be able to look up and see the stars at night, either through the roof or out the door. So the sukkah in my grandparents' apartment was hardly kasher. It was hardly a kosher sukkah. But in terms of the spirit of Sukkot, and bore the smell of the leaves and the fruits that were in this apartment. And the dinner by candlelight, and the singing, and then the reminiscing. It was the Sukkot of Sukkot for me. And again, I get chills just thinking about it. And my point is, many Jews build their own Sukkot in their own homes, in their own way, to be able to celebrate a holiday that really be belongs in Eretz Yisrael. But they want to relive the journey. They do relive the journey that we as a people, as a family, celebrate every year. And at the same time for the holiday of Sukkot, many synagogues and Jewish centers and other Jewish institutions erect their own Sukkah for their own communities. And there are as many different sizes and shapes of a sukkah as there are Jews who erect them. But their purpose is always the same, to relive our families wandering in the wilderness. And what must one do to fulfill the mitzvah to dwell in the sukkah? The commandment of sukkot is to dwell in the sukkah. That's the defining mitzvah of Sukkot, to dwell in the Sukkot. Must you literally live in it? Must you sleep in it? Actually, the Jewish tradition says that one fulfills the mitzvah to dwell in the Sukkot by eating in the Sukkot. It's always about eating, isn't it? So Jews go out of their way to make sure they eat at least once during the holiday of Sukkot, the festival of Sukkot. Sukkot. They go out of their way to eat at least one meal in the Sukkah. And there are many traditional Jews who eat every one of their meals in the Sukkah for the entire festival. And then the question is asked, so how much food must one consume inside the Sukkah to fulfill the mitzvah of dwelling in the Sukkah? And the answer is, at least a grape's worth of food. So every one of you who wishes to observe and celebrate the festival of Sukkot, be sure to eat at least a grape's worth of food inside a Sukkah. And it also reminds me of another wonderful childhood memory of mine, Sukkot. My grandparents, the same grandparents, lived around the corner from a small Orthodox shul on West 79th Street. And my, grand, my grandfather would often take me with him. And one Sukkot, on one Sukkot, he took me. And I remember sitting next to him for what seemed to be a long time. And when the service was over, the rabbi, who had this flowing white beard, seemed happier 
than usual. And there was a door at the back of the bima, the stage upon which the rabbi and cantor and the ark sits and the table on which the Torah is read. At the back of the bima, there was a door. I'd always fantasized as a child about what lay behind that door. What was it? Why was it that door was never opened? And I never saw it ever used. But on the night of Sukkot, lo and behold, the rabbi moved to that door, the door I'd never seen used. And he opened it. And turning to the congregation, he beckoned all of us to follow him through the door. And remember how awesome it was for me to walk with my grandfather up onto the bima and through that door. And suddenly I found myself on the fire escape attached to the back of the building. That, was, that is what was behind that door. And on the fire escape, the synagogue had, con had constructed a sukkah. Branches and leaves and fruits and vegetables all hanging on this constructed sukkah on the fire escape. And then inside the sukkah there was a long table with schnapps and with sponge cake. But this time on the table there was also a huge bowl of chocolate M&M's. And I loved M&M's. And while the adults had their schnapps and sponge cake, I celebrated Sukkot with fistfuls of M&M's. And that left an imprint on my child's Jewish consciousness, which I've never forgotten. And you know, I told that story to my congregation as I was teaching about the first Sukkot we would celebrate together. And without telling me, they went out and had bowls of M&Ms prepared for our first congregational sukkah celebration. And to their credit, they've had M&Ms as part of our celebration sukkot for the past 40 some odd years. And so the most important mitzvah of sukkot is to dwell in the sukkah. There's a blessing we recite which refers to the commandment of leishev ba sukkah, to dwell in the sukkah. But dwelling in the sukkah is not the only distinctive mitzvah of Sukkot. There's another, especially beautiful and important mitzvah, what's known as the waving of the lulav. In Hebrew, the taking of the lulav. In some ways, Sukkot has been likened to the American holiday of Thanksgiving. And to be sure, if we were studying Jewish holidays in a university classroom, we would learn how Jewish holidays are celebrations built upon ancient pagan holidays. Almost all pagan holidays follow the agricultural cycle of the year. It's why so many religions have their own holidays now so close together. They're all imprinted upon ancient pagan holidays that follow the major cycles of the agricultural year and the seasons and the flowing of the moon, the sun, and often holidays are celebrations that mark a harvest or some other cultural, I'm sorry, agricultural event. Passover is a spring holiday with a theme of birth, as nature comes alive. So we celebrate the birth of the Jewish people. Shavuot occurs at the time of the barley harvest. And Sukkot occurs at harvest time as well especially in the land of Israel. But the chidush, the Torah and Jewish tradition offer us, the, a, a new idea, a stroke of genius, an insight, is that the Jewish tradition took general celebrations and infused them with meaning. With meaning for the Jewish people and with universal moral meaning. And so while Jewish holidays were once upon a time, in ancient times, harvest holidays, in the Jewish tradition, 
They are festivals that mark the most crucial events in our people's history, in our family's history, that we might feel we experienced these events ourselves. A theme known best, by the way, in relation to Passover, when the Haggadah tells us to remind our children it's because of what God did for me when I was a slave in Egypt, and he brought me out of bondage. We relive these days to feel intimately a part of our family's Jewish history. And so it's not simply about feeling a part of the past. It's not about the past. The other great contribution of the Jewish tradition is to teach us that our past history must sensitize us today to live as more compassionate people, to live more compassionate lives in the present. And so every Jewish festival also has a moral component to it that teaches us about what we want to do with our lives, what we want our lives to be. And Sukkot has marvelous lessons for contemporary Jewish living. And one lesson is to never take for granted the great bounty virtu virtually all of us have been blessed with as we live our lives with enough food and plenty while at the same time today there are many who live in hunger. It's that sense in which Sukkot in some way is a Jewish Thanksgiving holiday. And so on the festival of Sukkot we take four species of vegetation that represent all of God's bounty in this world and we hold them together we hold them together in what is known as the lulav and etrog and I have here the lulav and etrog the lulav has three of the species the etrog is the fourth. Normally the lulav is held in the person's hand of strength. So if you're right-handed, you hold the lulav in your right hand. If you're left-handed, you hold it in your left hand. And the lulav is this date palm stalk surrounded by myrtle on one side and willow on the other side. And then there's the etrog which is a member of the lemon family, a citron. And ultimately on the holiday of Sukkot, they're held together and we gently shake the lulav and the etrog in all six directions of the compass, expressing our hope that throughout the world, wherever people may dwell, they will also enjoy God's bounty and always have enough to eat that no human being shall ever know hunger. We are grateful for the gifts expressed by, symbolized by, the lulav and the etrog. And the waving or the taking of the lulav and etrog is the other wonderful symbol of Sukkot. By the way, there are many midrash on the lulav and etrog, especially that each one of the four species represents another part of the human being, of the human body. The palm stalk being the backbone, the willow and the myrtle representing the mouth and the eye, and the etrog representing the heart. And so the entire human being is expressing a commitment to see to it that no other human being is without, is without in any way at all, during the coming year. That's the moral power of the commandment to waive the lulav and etrog. And the moral lesson of the sukkah itself is beautiful in so many ways, has so many meanings. On the one hand, we're reminded that life has a transient cast to it. We're always moving. One can never become so fixed in his or her personal life, so sure of him or herself, that we're unable to change. And we're reminded that no matter how comfortable we may become in any given place, we always must be willing to move on, to evolve, 
especially if we find ourselves having to compromise our values and our ideals, our ideals if we want to stay fixed in a place. The Jew has never been fixed. Even in Eretz Yisrael, the Jew builds a sukkah as a way of expressing a mentality. And then there's the sense of journey. In the Torah, the Israelites wander in the wilderness of the physical Sinai Desert. But spiritually, Sukkot reminds us all that we are on a dramatic journey through time. Our wilderness is not a physical desert. But we live in a world in which there still is hunger and poverty and disease and war. And the worst of all human evils, loneliness. That's the desert of time, spiritual time that we live in. And we are all on an eternal journey through this time across the generations which bind us to our grandparents and parents and all those who came before us whom we remember in love or imagine as our people's ancestors. And we're all linked to our children's generation and our grandchildren's generation. And we live today knowing that our actions will have impact on them, those whom we love more than life itself. We know that the decisions we make today are not only for us today. The decisions we make must always take into account the consequences for the generations yet to come, generations we are bound to by a sacred bond into the future. And our actions and our deeds today model for our children, our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren what we want for them those who will be sharing our journey for generations yet to come. That's the larger message of Sukkot. And it's why this holiday has always been linked in the Jewish tradition to the idea of the Messiah or the Messianic age. Somehow, the celebration of Sukkot heralds the best that lives within the human heart and the human soul and is the promise of a yet sweeter, gentler, more peaceful, more harmonious human existence for all. And in the Torah, while the festival of Sukkot is actually a seven-day holiday, an eighth day in the diaspora, even in the Torah, there's an additional day added, an eighth day called Shmini Yatzeret, which means eighth day of assembly. And the, the rabbis ask, why is an additional day added, tacked on to the holiday of Sukkot? And the answer the rabbis give us is that because Sukkot is the third and last of the Shalosh Regalim, the last of the three pilgrimage festivals, it is the last time the Jewish family, the Jewish people, will be coming to Jerusalem for the entire year. And it's as if God says to the Jewish people, oh, stay one more day before you leave for the year, until the next Passover. Stay one more day. And so the rabbis teach us, an eighth day is added, Shmini Yatzeret. And at the end of Shmini Yatzeret, an additional ninth day has been added by the Jewish tradition, as the rabbis created the holiday of Simchat Torah. It's not in the Torah itself. A rabbinic creation, Simchat Torah, the joy or happiness of the Torah, which is marked by one of the most exuberant of all Jewish celebrations. On Simcha Torah, Simcha's Torah, the Jewish community completes the annual reading of the entire Torah and immediately rolls the Torah from the final book of Deuteronomy all the way back to the first chapter of the first book, the book of Genesis, to begin reading the Torah all over again in a new year. It's the Jewish tradition's way of reminding all of us that we never finish reading Torah. 
It's a never-ending source of learning and inspiration. So on Simchat Torah, we don't simply complete the Torah, we immediately begin reading from the beginning once again. And then all the Torah scrolls are taken from the ark, and every adult gets to dance with the Torah, as all the children of the entire community follow behind, waving Jewish flags, sometimes with candied apples on them. And to dance with the Torah on Simchat Torah is one of the most glorious experiences a Jew can ever know. And if you ever read Elie Wiesel's book, Jews of Silence, he records how during the days of communism in the Soviet Union, Jews who had no real idea of what Judaism was would still flood Arkhipova Street in front of the great synagogue of Moscow to sing and dance with the Torah on Simchat Torah. I hope every one of you gets the chance to dance with the Torah on Simchat Torah. And with Simchat Torah, the season of the Sukkot festival is concluded. I hope this has given you some better sense of the holiday of Sukkot or Sukkot, a better idea of what this holiday is all about. And even if you have celebrated many Sukkot festivals yourself, I hope this episode of Jewish 101 will enhance your own experience and celebration of the festival as you relive the third event that marked the creation of the Jewish people. As always, I hope you'll be in touch with me with any reactions to this episode of Jewish 101. And do you have any wonderful childhood memories of Sukkot you'd like to share with me? I'd love to hear from you. So please, email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall, or tweet me. I'll be most appreciated. My thanks to Serge Goldberg, Sloan Copeland, to Ilya Arbit, and Dara Golub for helping to produce this episode of Jewish 101. Until the next time, be well, my friends. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.